Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sheila Stotts from GoodMinds.com. And today I'm pleased to be invited to share information about First Nations authors, titles, and publishers, as well as uh, some new trends in 2013. What to choose for a presentation? That's always a question I have, and I ponder that before I make my final selection, because there's always so many more things to talk about than there is time. Um, but hopefully, I have selected a range of some new titles, authors, publishers. OK, we will now move on to the next slide, or I should say the first slide. Um, Talking about First Nations Readers Advisory, there are some trends that I have noticed at Good Mind uh, from the time I have started with them in 2000 to the present. And one of the more exciting ones is uh, the proliferation of the graphic novel. Uh, First Nations Aboriginal Métis and Inuit content and authors for graphic novels there was a little slow in starting. I think we all recall the um, Louis Real comic strip bio by Chester Brown in 2006, and that kind of led the way. Now uh, a small press uh, out of Portage in Maine, Winnipeg, the High Water Press, is now publishing uh, the work of David Alexander Robertson in the Seven Generations series, and that's a, a set of four teen uh, graphic novels with themes of contemporary issues uh, drawn together through the residential school um, period and into uh, the present day. So that's one of the newer exciting things, and we're also looking at some individual publishers in the US and Canada who are inviting graphic novel uh, illustrators and authors to work on uh, new publications. The next uh, slide, slide number three. At OLA this year, I presented in a workshop that was a First Nations circle on the Saturday morning. And I was talking, of course, about new books and issues and things like that. And just at that time period, Idle No More and Attawapiskat was in the, the mainstream news and also in social media. And we were seeing Walter Wall coverage on CBC. It even spilled over to the United States. And I actually saw some signs of Idle No More um, popping up on CNN. So. It's an issue that has now come to the forefront all across Canada. And I think one thing to do is to look for resources that can assist uh, patrons, uh, educators, whomever, um, about First Nations and what are the issues in getting behind the social media tweets and, and uh, demonstrations and flash mobs and that. And one publication by Wes Witzer from the Union of Ontario Indi Indians, Wes, uh, Maurice Witzer, sorry, is a respected um, journalist. He's Ojibwe. And he also felt the need for helping all Canadians understand that we are all treaty people. It's not just the First Nations who have treaties. And this is an accessible publication, 34 pages, illustrated. Uh, excellent for the middle middle school grades, high school, anyone with uh, literacy issues, or just the general public, because it brings that First Nations opinion, perspective, and the authentic voice to what are treaties, where do they come from, and what is our common history in Canada. Slide number four. Also going on with the, the Idle No More theme, I did a book list for the people at the OLA presentation on the Saturday morning. And they seemed quite uh, supportive of doing a separate book list and, and helping them for finding titles that could fit 
with their patrons' questions and interests. And the new uh, resource uh, just published last year is Thomas King. Um, Thomas King is a liter literature professor. Um, he comes from the US. He has Cherokee and Greek ancestry. And people who listen to the CBC might recall him being on the Dead Dog Cafe series. Well, he's come up with another, uh, another book uh, following up on his truth about stories from the Massey Lectures called The Inconvenient Indian, A Curious Account of Native People in North America. I'd be happy to know that there are no footnotes, although some, some readers may want to know uh, what the source of this is, or is this an opinion, or who are you quoting here. But he puts in his authentic humor, uh, biting satire, uh, along with the stark historical and current reality of First Nations. The next slide uh, takes a more uh, legal view of issues and concerns of First Nations. This is John Borrow's uh, law titles. He has done three to date. He um, draws on oral traditions, um, pictographic scrolls, dreams, and common law case analysis and philosophical reflection to explore issues pressing that are pressing on the future of Indigenous law. And he offers readers a new way to think about the direction of Canadian law. And the Canada's Indigenous Constitution is another legal um, offering that presents the idea that Canada's legal tradition and the Canadian Constitution has to accept indigenous legal traditions in order to make it a functioning um, constitution and that it needs to incorporate some of these ideas and messages that indigenous knowledge uh, possesses. Those would be for your adult patrons who have an interest in the, the legal aspect. Something that will appeal to most readers is a nice little handbook, 66 pages, so it's very accessible. It's from a small press in Ontario, uh, Ningwakwe Learning Press. Their focus is literacy and adult literacy. But I'm finding their more recent publications are accessible and valued by high school um, librarians, teachers, and people who just want a quick guide for something. And they don't want to read a 300-page footnoted uh, text. So stepping up a personal guide to being an involved citizen in a First Nations community by Jody Keshigo offers readers a personal experience how-to guide. And he is talking directly to First Nations, but he's also talking to other Canadians. Uh, he gives some background into how First Nations work, uh, how reserves are funded, and that's always an issue that comes up in, in Parliament and uh, in various political parties and other organizations, and how a First Nation infrastructure is organized. And other topics that are briefly discussed include self-determination, uh, band council committees, how to volunteer, and running for office and being a, an elected a councillor. And he pulls in his own personal family history to reflect on how does one become an active citizen. The next slide, slide number seven. It doesn't want to. There we go. Uh, it's a selection of additional publications uh, that have just come out from Ningwakwe. And this wonderful little press 
located at Saugeen First Nation. It offers resources about art, which can be found in the beadwork, uh, First Peoples Beading History and Techniques. And, and to me, that's one of the best books on beadwork there is. It answers questions. It doesn't take an anthropological perspective on, or a muse museology perspective on uh, beading. It gives you um, a First Nation perspective. Uh, Christy Belcourt is a Métis uh, beadwork artist and is well renowned for her work. And uh, she has just put together a fabulous little book. It's also a how-to guide but also some teachings in, in history. Ningwakwe also does information and health-related titles, like the HIV AIDS Awareness. You take a story from a, an individual fictionalized person and offer straightforward, factual, medical information for the layperson. We've also done a resource on Anishinaabe men's teaching. And this is a really interesting resource because it takes the seven grandfather teachings and offers very practical ideas for how does a First Nation or Ojibwe man uh, in today's society, how does he practice that? And an elder speaks and a youth speaks, and they provide ideas and practical suggestions for a living out and being um, this positive person who understands his traditional teachings. The other uh, title, Listening to Mother Earth and Father Sky, Teachings for Urban Aboriginals. I kind of cringed when I saw this title, but as I read it, I um, was very convinced that this is a title that we must support and, and, and carry a good mind. Uh, the use of Aboriginals uh, the adjective as a noun uh, it just didn't sit well with me. Um, but barring that, uh, it is an excellent resource uh, for First Nations people or Aboriginal people living in urban settings and just drawing on some traditional teachings that, uh, that also offer practical advice for a person living today in a, in a large or small city. Now, for children's and younger readers, um, Louise Erdrich is the renowned, award-winning Ojibwe author. Uh, the first one was major novel was Love Medicine. She has turned her attention to the younger reader. Um, Chickadee is now a story that is uh, from the 1880s that's in an, in an Ojibwe community in North Dakota. And it's kind of following up on her previous titles, The Porcupine Year. Anyway, in this um, novel for children, she brings in what happens to a, an Ojibwe boy uh, living with his family in the 1880s. Uh, he meets Métis fur traders. She introduces Red River carts into this storyline. Uh, the boy is abducted, but he manages to use his skill and knowledge and the help of his uncle to return to his family. And it's, it's a very um, accessible book um, of interest to boys and girls and is well written. And will also nicely fit in with your grade 5 or grade 6 um, story time or novels to read to support the social studies curriculum. Number nine, I think most people are aware of Richard Wagamese, the Ojibwe author who currently lives in BC. He was a journalist. Um, he writes fiction and nonfiction. And uh, his earlier nonfiction was a, a bio memoir type of a uh, book um, for Joshua, written for his son. Uh, Indian Horse, of course, was part of the CBC's uh, reading series um, that was just aired uh, lately and was defended by an Olympic athlete. 
Unfortunately, it didn't win, but um, it is an excellent novel. It's a very quick read. It moves along. It, it combines hockey, the great Canadian pastime, and residential schools, and the story about uh, Saul Indian Horse and how he deals with uh, his life in kind of a, um, a Dr. Drew setting. He's in a treatment center, so he's got the uh, issues, and he realizes the only way he's going to get any help or assistance in this setting is to tell his story, and this is the account of his story. Um, I was a little disappointed in Charlotte Gray's comments on um, this title during the, the uh, CBC series. Um, it, it's not like a general Canadian novel that there is not this happy ending happening. It's an ongoing thing, and uh, Richard Wagamese does this really well, and he leaves you with things to think about. Plus, no one uh, really mentioned the humor that is in this novel. Uh, that's something uh, Richard uh, combines with, with the drama, with the difficult issues. Uh, his other titles were The Next Shore Thing, which was a very rapid read, high interest, uh, low vocab, and just coming out soon is a collection of poetry, Runaway Dream, something to uh, add to the poetry collection. Uh, slide number 10. Thinking about uh, what every library in Canada should have is something by Anton Truer. He's an Ojibwe professor from the States. Although it is an American publication, it transfers really well across the border because everything you wanted to know about Indians but were afraid to ask is this question and answer style um, publication. It's published by the Minnesota Historical Society, but I give them credit for writing something that is very practical and timely. You know, do Indians pay taxes? He addresses that. What about casinos and gaming? Uh, he addresses that. And these issues are very similar on both sides of the border, whether they're boarding schools or residential schools or treaties or justice or, or anything else. And he does it with an excellent sense of humor and practical information. So I highly recommend his titles. Um, Living Our Language, where he talks about Ojibwe story and oral tradition by interviewing uh, several elders and their stories. And a large publication that is all-encompassing of North America, the Indian Nations uh, Random Houses publication combined with National Geographic, the co-publishers on the Indian Nations of North America, which is a general information book. And I recommend Anton's work to all libraries. In the literature area, we have a wealth of uh, writers in Canada and from the US. Lee Miracle is a well-known Salish uh, author, storyteller, uh, also uh, a professor in Toronto. Uh, her most recent collection is The First Wives Club, the Coast Salish style, and that's a collection of short stories. And it's not just about women. It also includes stories about men and, uh, and youth. And I'm looking forward to the reprint of her novel, Daughters Are Forever, which I think is one of the best books of it from a First Nations author or any author about uh, the role of women and the connection of daughters and their mothers. And it's just a brilliant read. And I was very disappointed when it went out of print. But Thetis is now going to reissue Daughters Are Forever within the next two years. So look for that one. A very uh, interesting development is an anthology of indigenous science fiction. And that's something we don't have a lot of. There's not a lot of science fiction authors. Uh, the only one that I knew was um, Gary William uh, from BC. 
and then Daniel Heath Justice and Heath Trilogy. Um, but Grace Dillon, a prof from University of Arizona, put together a wonderful collection, an anthology for um, senior secondary readers um, and adult readers, uh, a collection of um, First Nations and Native American authors who deal with science fiction. And their take on it is really in the realm of what we call, um, or what has been called by people who analyze literature and criticize literature, is magical realism. That's kind of their style of writing. So that's, that's a very interesting collection. Uh, for reluctant readers, uh, Hook Up is a, is a novel from um, James Lorimer. Kim Fernston has developed a, a really cool storyline um, about a Sutina um, youth and his girlfriend. So there's issues of teenage pregnancy, uh, whether she should have an abortion, should she keep the child. And it's a very um, fast-moving novel that's very easy to read, and it's aimed at the reluctant reader category or could also be used for um, adult literacy. And James Sinclair has edited um, a wonderful collection, an anthology, again from High Water Press, which is Portage in Maine in Winnipeg, um, of Aboriginal writings uh, from the land of water from Manitoba. So we have some well-known Canadian authors, writers, uh, their poetry, their short story, um, opinion, essay, um, and, and memoir type of story. So you have people like Beatrice Cullison and, and so on, and some new and upcoming authors uh, from Manitoba. And it, it, that's a really good collection. Next slide. In the world of biography, we have the um, new publication uh, from Blair Stonechild through Fifth House, Fitzhenry and Whiteside, about Buffy St. Marie. And Blair Stonechild is really a, a historian in the West, um, but he um, got access with Buffy and had her blessing to write this bio, um, a story of her life, and it's entitled It's My Way. And it's a very good read about her, her work uh, growing up, uh, her childhood, her education, uh, and, and her music, and her other educational activism work that she's doing in later life. Uh, the other um, new title that we've just brought in is about Sherman Alexi. And uh, it's all about the author. And it's a series from a company called Rosen from the US. But because Sherman Alexi wrote uh, part-time diary, oh, yeah, the absolutely true diary of a part-time Indian, which is really uh, a very interesting title for uh, young adults and teens, and is one of our better sellers for the high school market. Um, we figured that a bio and literary criticism about Sherman Alexi and his life uh, would be a great addition to our, our titles. And they've made this a very fun, accessible uh, book. So we have lists, we have charts, we have graphs, we have short um, quotations. Um, there's a little bit of information about the absolutely true diary, a little bit of uh, cold notes type um, background, uh, but it's all done in, in very accessible and um, interesting ways that brings in the teen reader to uh, pick up this book and, uh, and look through it and, and dip into it. Slide number 13. Uh, in the reference area, there's not been a whole lot of, of new titles that, that are all-encompassing and are, are good resources, but um, I did find uh, the Dreamcatcher book. I was a little hesitant when I heard that Firefly was producing a book on Dreamcatchers, and I thought, oh, great, here we have another collection of, of 
stories and whatever and, you know, phony dream catchers that, that you can buy anywhere in dollar stores or whatever. But I was pleasantly surprised to find this is a very well done book, a uh, coffee table type book, 144 pages, and 40 color photographs and also some black and white. So the author has taken a kind of anthropological, historical look at dream catchers. So history puts it in context and also brings it up to the present day and how dream catchers and that idea and their meaning and their importance don't really care for the legend and lore type title. That kind of threw me too. But when you open the book, you do find that there is good information, and it's something that a lot of people are interested in or have seen or have one and may not know exactly what, what is the meaning behind dream catchers and what is the First Nation understanding of dream catchers and what is, what is that history and cultural context. The other one is another Firefly title is um, Theodore Brasser's Native American Clothing and Illustrated History. So I was a bit disappointed, but then again, when I realized that the author is a curator at the Canadian Museum of Civilization and a professor of art history at Carleton, then I realized his background and where he was coming from. So he does that particular anthropological approach, uh, sets up the culture areas from the Arctic, the subarctic, the woodland, the plateau, the plains, and the west coast, and uh, does information, provides information about the nations within each culture region, and information about clothing and adornment, and um, like saddles for horses from the plains, and other, in addition to basic clothing styles. So, 300 full color and black and white photographs, well worth the um, cost of, of this title. Um, the interesting thing about the, the illustrations is that they're taken from collections where you really wouldn't think there'd be a collection. So we have some never before shown in book format type illustrations and photographs of various artifacts that are stored within uh, a museum or an archive collection that it doesn't make it into the regular uh, information books about First Nations clothing. So that is a, a good resource, um, just understanding where the author is coming from and his background. Uh, new children's titles of interest, um, a brand new series from an American publisher, and I'm always wary, and I have to look at each and every book before I uh, accept it and uh, say that, yes, it is a good resource. And I was pleasantly surprised to uh, learn that Gareth Stevens in the, in the States um, just came out with a series on um, Native American uh, First Nations. Uh, it's part of their series, Native American Library. And they do, his, they do histories of the Ojibwe, the Cree, the Mohawk, the Oneida, which is a very rarely documented First Nation, um, as well as Blackfoot, uh, Sioux, and, and other nations, especially found in the US. Ojibwe and Cree were particularly important because they do cover both Canada and the US. And they don't just focus on the American side, which a lot of these types of books do. Uh, it's uh, written for grade six and up. And it says for people interested in reading levels, Fontes and Pinnell, it's the W is their, their leveling. And topics include uh, removal um, from lands by the Canadian and the US government reserve and reservation life, relocation to urban areas, uh, information about the American Indian movement. Uh, it also looks at the historical seasonal lifestyle, cultural traditions, family life, 
government beliefs and stories. And it makes good use of the timeline, a glossary, uh, and suggested activities for further um, learning opportunities. So it's a very good series. Now, the one caution for this series, and it was a big disappointment, which I really had to write and tell the publisher that for some reason, when they did the Inuit title, I didn't really think they would get this wrong. Uh, there's so much information about the Inuit of the Arctic. Um, they proceeded to call it Inuit History and Culture, but inside the text and throughout, they used plural Inuit and didn't realize that Inuit is a plural noun. So hopefully in their next reprinting, they will get it right. And uh, the odd thing is, some sentences and captions are correct. So it's almost like the editor and the copywriter didn't get together and say, OK, we've got to decide on, on what is this. And it's, it's not hard to find the correct usage of Inuit and Inuk. Uh, Inuk is a singular. Inuit is the plural, so I was very disappointed. When you get somebody's name wrong and the name of their, their people, um, no matter how good the information is and the illustrations are, it, it just doesn't cut it. So very disappointed in that one. But the other titles are excellent. Slide 15. Uh, looking for Ojibwe information, finding it in a couple of places. And the exciting news is Basil Johnston, the Ojibwe elder, teacher, storyteller, linguist, former museum ethnologist, um, and prolific as ever, uh, has now come out with a collection, and his latest publication is Living in Harmony. And it is taking stories of Ojibwe storytellers and producing a bilingual collection. So um, say there's 10 stories. They appear in English, uh, and then they will have the Ojibwe following that story. So you, for people who have uh, language learners or people who want to see what Ojibwe is or just to be introduced to Ojibwe words and stories, this is a really good collection. Living in Harmony is 114 pages. The first title in his series of stories is The Gift of the Stars. And um, Gift of the Stars did uh, receive honorable mention for Canada from, for the Ibi Awards. And uh, we were very pleased to hear that. And it comes from Tegadant Press, another small press that is devoted to First Nation voices and authentic uh, literature. For the adult or the uh, senior reader, the, the reader who wants to delve more into understanding Ojibwe teachings and stories, uh, from the University of Nebraska comes uh, the island of the Anishinaabeg, the thunderers and the water monsters in the traditional Ojibwe life world. And that's looking at contemporary Ojibwe people and their experiences and the understanding and belief and practice of their spirituality and through interpreting the relationship between these underwater spirits, the thunders, and the underwater creatures. So it's a very interesting read, um, taking these little-known stories, or they're only written in obscure anthropology journals uh, in uh, university libraries collections. So you'd never really see it. but. Teresa Smith is a professor of religious studies at Indiana University. And she went and talked to people at uh, Wakemakong and talked about 
these stories and the meaning of that, uh, their, their meaning to Ojibwe people today. Um, so a very interesting read. Uh, for Ojibwe young readers, uh, my last collection here is uh, Chad Solomon's The Little Spirit Buried Productions. He is now delving into uh, graphic novels for the younger reader. So it's a series of these seven little books. Um, each, of the st each of these seven are standalone titles. And each one is based on one of the seven grandfather teachings. So courage, honesty, respect, love, truth, wisdom, humility. And he uses an animal to represent that teaching. And there's a, a storyline that's very accessible for younger children. They're only 18 pages long. And it is highly valued and recommended for people doing uh, leveled readers or just introducing uh, Ojibwe content and character education. He works with an Ojibwe educator, Tanya Leary. And the great thing about this series, uh, it also is available in a French edition. So that's um, some of the new offerings from Chad Solomon. Well, I see we're coming up to 3 o'clock. And I'm now going to open it up for comment, discussion, questions, um, any ideas from the people listening, um, something you found in your area that is of interest or recommended reading. Uh, so I want to um, say Niawa Goa, thank you very much to uh, the Ontario Library Service North and the invitation to present. Well, thank you very much, Sheila. Uh, I haven't seen any questions come up in the chat box, but uh, I'll just remind participants you can unmute your line by using pound six. Are there any questions for Sheila? Maybe while people are thinking, Sheila, I have a question. Um, in my work as skills development advisor, I'm often looking for recommended books to add to book lists, whether they're on certain themes or for certain age groups. Um, so in addition to goodminds.com, are there any websites or other resources you can recommend that would help me in that? Hello, Sheila, can you hear me? Ah. Sheila, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. I, I, okay. I, okay. Uh, I'll repeat my question. <laughs> yes, I, he I heard the question. Any other sources for um, creating okay. book lists? Okay. Yes. Sorry. I, I don't know what's happened to me. We have a new phone system here, and I'm just learning it. <laughs> okay, no problem. <laughs> I just did pound six myself, just in case. So. Yeah. No. Um, I always use Canadian materials, especially if it's for a school audience. Um, and that goes from elementary to secondary. Or um, I use some of the databases through my local library that I have access to. Okay. Um, Can you name some? Uh, what is it? It's called, was it Master File? Um, okay. It's EBSCO. It's the EBSCO folks. Okay. Those nice people who let you look at journals and reviews and... Um, then there's uh, like there's novel novel list, right. which is in the same package kind of. You just go into the novel section and you put in First Nations, Mohawk, Ojibwe, whatever, and and hope some titles come up. Or um, that there's like a junior novel list for kind of elementary readers. Just looking for for that uh, type of material. Okay, great. I'm making notes here. <laughs> And I also use Tidal Wave, too. Tidal Wave? Tidal Wave, yeah. And is that through a database, or that's a standalone? That's a database, yeah. That's an American database. But surprisingly, they do have a lot of Canadian publishers. And they collect, um, especially for their reading levels, and they kind of collect all the reviews from School Library Journal, Kirkus Review, all of those kind of good 
reviews, and uh, they do uh, children's books and uh, adult books. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions for Sheila right now? We do have a, about 10 minutes left. We have a fair, fair bit of time for questions. So I'll just ask one more for you, Sheila. Mm -hmm. um, before you, I think you mentioned that before you include a book into your collection, you you look through it. So have, do, you, do publishers send you the physical copies, or? Um, the great thing about Good Minds is we've hired a, a school a school library consultant, and she's from the former teacher librarian at Thames Valley District School Board. Okay. And she's retired from there, and so she's really gotten me into accessing um, the sales reps. Because okay. <laughs> we used to have trouble just getting a catalog from a, from a company right. <laughs> when we started out, but now they actually come to us and, and want to spend time with us and, and show us their new offerings for the season type of thing. And, um, and they've been very good, and, and she's been very good at sharing the catalogs and um, the sales rep will come and uh, talk to her, and then they'll come and stop by me, and they'll flag all the pages where they've got <laughs> Aboriginal content on, and they'll bring me, um, you know, the galleys or whatever they have, or they'll they'll give me a complimentary copy. So okay, great. So we've really got them. a good relationship that way. Excellent. So I guess I'll take this moment now to thank you very much, Sheila, for presenting today's webinar, um, and thank you to the other librarians who participated. And I think I can speak on behalf of everyone here, Sheila, that we really do appreciate your willingness to share your expertise. Um, and I feel very lucky to have access to such a rich resource yourself. So thank you very much.